Welcome to the Wolf Packers show. It's been a little while. I'm Matt Carter. I'm joined by Ethan McDowell. And today we're going to really dive into NC State uh, basketball as we're kind of winding down silly season. It's, it's kind of towards a lot of a lot of these guys are making decisions. And so we're getting to a point where we can really kind of digest how the roster looks. But before we do that, just a real quick few reminders and some housekeeping items. Um, please uh, rate and review this podcast wherever you might get your po- podcast, Spotify, Apple, wherever we're there. Um, rate us, preferably a nice rating if, if, if you would. And um, don't be afraid to leave a comment as well. Um, if you want to watch this podcast you can do so on our youtube channel please subscribe to our youtube channel we've been on a quest to get 2000 helped with the algorithm helped with the uh site and, and resources we have with this web website um we're very proud of our channel so please um take a moment to follow us on youtube um also join the wolfpacker.com we have a lot of information ethan has been out and about in force with football recruiting, I'm telling you, in about a month's time, football recruiting is going to go absolutely nuts, like completely off the rails nuts. And you're going to want to be there when all that information comes flying. So take advantage of some of the deals that On3 has to offer to join the website. Give it a like, um, give it a a chance, and and I guarantee you, you won't go away. Um, So do that. Last but not least, um, we also have to give a shout out to our sponsor, RogueShop.com. That's R-O-G as in girl, U-E, shop.com, S-H-O-P. Uh, they have all your natural cannabis needs, whether you're suffering from some anxiety or you have sleep deprivation or chronic pain issues, inflammation. Now, these are natural legal supplements that may be able to help you. They helped out you know, one of the founders of the business. It's a small business owned by a husband and wife. The husband's a disabled veteran. Uh, he, he uses his own products, obviously, believes in, in them. And they're on our message boards. Um, if you have any questions, they also have a live chat feature on their website with an actual human being. In the world of AI, it's an actual human being on the other end of their website talking to you. So uh, support them. Give give them a look. If you might have a need for it, give it a try. If you never tried it, maybe, maybe this will be something that can help you out. So got all that in in less than three minutes. Let's get to what we want to talk about. NC State basketball and we'll, we'll digest some of the individual issues uh additions and everything in a moment but i just want to go big picture i'll throw it to ethan how do you like where or dislike whatever the case may be where nc state stands on may 4th the morning of may 4th just after by the way on the website last night on three joe tipson another reason why to be a member of on three joe tipson owns and i mean owns the transfer portal. Nobody gets the news before Joe Tipton. Uh, He broke the news last night. Jaden Bradley was transferring to Arizona. Um, So, there's one target missed there. But Ethan, all in all, where do you like NC State or dislike NC State right now? Yeah, the Jaden Bradley recruitment is really the only negative I can really take away from the transfer window. I think they've crushed it otherwise. Now, I love what they've done. Um, I know it started a little slow, which caused a little stress for um, Wolfpack fans. But, uh, you know, um, I know Levi Watkins, the assistant coach, he tweeted out, like, the timeline for last year. And, right. you know, that turned out so well. And it looks like um, they're assembling another squad here. And I'm really excited. I, I think um, they brought in some guys that uh, – you're not going to completely replace a Terquavion Smith or a Jarkel Joyner. That's really tough to do. That's two all ACC players. But um, I think they did everything they could to bring in a really, really talented group and um, bring in some big men that are going to really add some versatility to the front court. Guys that can do a few different things, stretch the floor, and um, kind of spell DJ Burns and um, 
I think uh, all these guys have high major experience, um, which, you know, that's, that wasn't even the case with a lot of the guys they brought in last year. Now we're bringing in guys with um, – State's bringing in guys who have proven track records of success with major schools at NCAA tournament schools. So I'm really excited about it. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing what they could do on the court. We could also note DJ Burns confirmed he is definitely coming yes. back for next year. We'll dive into that in a second. But um, I'm going to run through the transfers because there's been a lot of them. So some people may have forgotten them. You got Jaden Taylor, who is the, the leading scorer at Butler. Which is a Big East team. Wasn't a very good Big East team this year for Butler. But I think we saw in the NCAA tournament maybe the Big East was a, a little bit underappreciated. Maybe they were la- this year's version of last year's ACC, where a lot of people didn't maybe respect the Big East as much as they should have. And then NCAA tournament comes along and you realize Big East was pretty good. Um, got DJ Horn, who was one of uh, a double digit scorer. At Arizona State, who made the NCAA tournament, beat Nevada in that one of those first four games in in Dayton, uh, and then nearly beat um, blanking on the name, but they nearly beat the sixth seed in the um, in the next game. I want to say it might have been a Big East team. Now that I think about it, but I can't remember who it was off the top of my head. Um. Then you also brought in MJ Rice from Kansas. You know, he didn't play an extensive role at Kansas. Kansas kind of had a log jam at his position, which I explained when I went through his analysis of maybe why he didn't play much, but he was a, a borderline five star, if not a five star, on a lot of services, a McDonald's All American, and he got three years of eligibility left. And the good thing with MJ Rice is, is you only get one one time exception on the transfer. And so, you you know you got MJ Rice pretty much locked in probably for the next two to three years unless he's so good he goes to the NBA. Um, And the same thing with Jaden Taylor because he's a sophomore. Then you got uh, a couple of bigs, Muhammad Diara from Missouri. Saw a lot of playing time in SEC play after not playing much in non-conference, but was considered by some to be the number one junior college player the year before, and Missouri was a good team, 25-win team. Um, got upset in the second round by Princeton on its way to a Cinderella Sweet 16. And then last but certainly not least, Ben Middlebrook uh, from Clemson, who kind of stuck behind P.J. Hall there at Clemson. We know Clemson's a good team. I think NC State's all the best of Ben Middlebrook this past year and what he could do, uh, unfortunately, for NC State. Uh, but... Um, both DR and middle books listed at 610 plus as well. So let's start there. Let, let's start with the post. You're essentially hoping that middle books and DR is an upgrade over Mohorsik and Dewana. Mohorsik is in the portal. Dewana is going to play for Georgia Tech next year. Your thoughts on that, Ethan? Is a combination of DJ Burns plus DR middle books better, the same, maybe a slight drop off of the combination of Burns, Mahorsha, who was unavailable for pretty much all last year, and Dewana. Yeah, um, I think kind of taking Mahorsha out of it just because, um, like he wasn't available and he might not have been available for a chunk of the upcoming season. I mean, if you take him out of it, it's absolutely an upgrade. Um, <laughs> but you know, I what I love, I mentioned it earlier, was just you're bringing in two guys that could add a little bit of floor spacing. Um, like Middlebrooks wasn't asked to do that at Clemson. He was asked to be just a traditional post big. Um, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what he can do, maybe expand his range a little bit. And um, Diara, I mean, he showed the ability to knock down a few threes at Missouri and um, did so as well at the junior college level. Um, and they're both guys that can – they play sound defense. They rebound. Um and they're even guys, you could put them at the four. You could play a super jumbo lineup with them and DJ Burns if you wanted to. And um, it's just so much more. There's going to be so much lineup versatility this year for NC State if everyone stays healthy. And um, 
that's great. And the ACC, where there's a lot of different teams that play a lot of different styles, and you got to be able to kind of mix and match your starting lineup, your eight man rotation to be able to, you know, kind of whether you're playing a Miami or a UVA, you know. Yeah, I kind of agree. Uh, obviously, Mahorchik's injury kind of skewed that question I just asked. But you know, when Mahorchik was healthy, and then he only really played a handful of games against quality mm-hmm. competition while he was healthy, he was a great compliment to DJ Burns. It was a contrast in styles that allowed Kevin Keats to kind of play matchups and kind of change the pace of the game a little bit and, and really force the issues on opponents. Um, and I think that's kind of what we, I think he wants to go for with middle books and DR, you know, and, and then there's some things they look, it's no secret that we'll see how DJ Burns looks come this far, but he struggled defending pick and rolls and, pick and pops and high ball screen last year. I think that's an area where maybe a Muhammad DR in particular could really help you out mm-hmm. defending some of those. If you're playing, like you mentioned, it allows you to mix and match against your opponents very well. I should add DR's rebounding numbers. If you do the, if you expand it out to like a 40 minute per game average and you, and you, you translate what he did in some of those SEC games, that are very impressive. And so he gives you a yeah. good rebound because they do lose Jack Clark and Mahorsik, obviously, with two of their best rebounders. Um, and I do think Middlebrooks is a, is a guy who just was blocked. Like, I, it, I don't blame Brad Brownell at all. You got P.J. Hall, NBA caliber big. You're going to put him on the court when he's healthy 30-some minutes a game. So – but I, I think there was a wide amount of respect for Ben Middlebrook. I think a lot, a lot of people, I know um, Matt Connolly at On3, when we asked him about Ben Middlebrook, thought that he could be a 10 to 12 points per game score and seven rebounds a game at the ACC. So um, I actually think they've ended up upgrading. Now here's the question in the backcourt. You're losing Jarkel Joyner. You're losing to Quavion Smith. You've added... Jaden Taylor, DJ Horn, and MJ Rice. So let's say let's throw in Jack Clark. You lost Jack Clark too. So you've lost those three. And you've got Jaden Taylor, DJ Horn, MJ Rice. Pretty clear they still would like to pursue a point guard. Um, Casey Morcell's in the draft. I think a lot of us would be surprised if he stayed in the draft. So let's say for the assumption of this argument, Casey Morcell's back. Jarkel to Quavion Clark replaced by Taylor Horn Rice. What's your thought on that? Right now, I mean, like I said earlier, it's hard to replace those two. It's probably a slight downgrade for me, but I think the guys they brought in is probably a best case scenario. I mean, you bring in a guy like MJ Rice, so that he's an NBA. Um, he has NBA potential. He he has the potential to um be a guard in the NBA, and I mean, then you can can um combine that with two players with the proven production at the high major level. Um, Horn does a little bit of everything. Um, Taylor he s- scores. He'll he'll shoot the ball and he'll he'll shoot it well. And um, he plays really hard defense, which I'm really excited about. I think offensively, it could be a little bit of a step back, just because you don't have um. I mean, Jarkel and Terquadron were two of the best um, just straight-up scores in the conference, if not the two best. So maybe a small step back there. But defensively, I think it could be like a, actually a really sizable step forward. I think you have, um, you know, Morcel obviously is a great defender. Um, pending whoever ends up coming in as point guard. But say for now you have um, Horn and Taylor in there, at least in some lineup. So those are two good defenders. Those are two guys that are going to really put in a lot of effort on that end of the floor. And um, shoot, I mean, we didn't get to see much of MJ Rice, but you have it's a six seven wing guy. If he puts in the effort, I'm sure he will be an awesome um, defensive player as well. So um, you know, if you can, you put all these scores on the floor. Guys with them who can shoot from the outside score at all three levels. You have DJ Burns in the middle, and you have like four to five wing players that can defend, like on the other end of the floor. Then that puts you in pretty good shape, and that'll win some basketball games. Yeah, I think the big question too is, um, 
you know, I, I agree with you. I think it would, on paper, you're thinking, okay, you lost two all ACC guys. One, um, I think they were one with first team and one with second. I can't remember off the top of my head last year. That's hard to replace, period, right? Like, I mean, sort of, sort of bringing in the biggest no brainers in the transfer portal. And I can't even think, I mean, you know, there they, they just weren't going to be a lot of guys that maybe you get one, but you couldn't get likely would to get two to replace that. I think this is an improved depth situation. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, Horn intrigues me because he is a scorer. He does shoot three very well. His percentage kind of dipped a little bit at Arizona State, but he's also going to be an older guy, fifth-year college basketball. Um, probably won't get to 2,000 career points, but he's had a heck of a lot of points in, in basketball. And he had a real nice NCAA tournament. Um, I think he scored 19 in both games in the NCAA tournament and shot really well. I think he was like four for five from threes in both games. Taylor is the one that kind of intrigues me because I, I really, from talking to people who covered Butler, we put up a piece for premium subscribers with a Butler beat writer who kind of broke it down. You know, the feeling I got was he could thrive in having that freedom that Kevin Keats is very well known for. Sometimes frustrates fans how much freedom the guards get, but he, the picture I got was that Jaden Taylor is somebody that could thrive in that. And that Butler was not a team that could spread out the court. And an old familiar face there with Manny Bates. But they were a very compact team offensively. Uh, I think NC State spread it out quite a bit more. And so, and playing at a, 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 an increased pace. I'm, I'm curious about Jaden Taylor. I feel like a lot of, he kind of wanted the sleepers in the portal. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling if Jaden Taylor called up all 15 ACC teams and said, I want to come, I'm willing to bet 13 or 14 of them immediately would have said yes. Yeah. And the exception may have been Duke, which is, you know, hadn't taken any transfer because they don't have any scholarships right now. Um, so he's the one that kind of intrigued me. And I like that MJ Rice may let Kevin Keith go to what he loved best, which we saw his first year. Four guards, basically. I mean, the first couple of yeah. years, it was torn Dorn, who was just a great rebounder and so physical for being 6'4", 6'5". And it allowed Kevin Keith to play that lineup. And I think MJ Rice sort of gives that to him because he is a muscular wing. He's, I think, listed at 215 or 220 or something in that ballpark. Um, if they can prove that the ranking was legit and that it, if you look at the situation at Kansas, they had a Big 12 player of the year. They had one of the best transfers who was a senior from Texas Tech and was one of the best transfer portal guys last year. And they had Grady Dick, who was the um, tremendous six foot eight shooter that going into the NBA might be a lottery pick, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that was their three guys for those two, you know, that covered that kind of two, three, and four position for Kansas. And you, you, Bill Self is no idiot. He's going to play those guys 35 minutes a game. I mean, <laughs> and so it was just hard for a guy like MJ Rice to get into the, um, to get into the lineup. So let's assume that that was a situation and that they, there was a lot more than what he showed at Kansas. He might allow Kevin Keith to go smaller and more traditional, like he would, say, or, you know, Kevin Keith normally wants to do. But there is the million dollar question, uh, Ethan. If this was the roster right now, are you comfortable with the point guard situation or would that be a, a very big concern for you? I think I'm definitely in the minority here in terms of I wouldn't be that worried about it. I think with Horn and Taylor, you have two guys that can handle the ball. And um, I don't know if you need like a true bona fide like point guard, like in the traditional sense to run Keats's offense. I think um, you you look at, you know, Horn and Taylor, they're experienced guys. You know, they're going to be able to handle the basketball and they're not going to freak out when, um, you know, Miami starts full court pressing them or something. Um, and I mean, I almost, 
I don't want to say I'd prefer to have just two shot creators in there because there were times when like having a stabilizing presence and Jarko join are like really, really help. But um, I don't think NC State has to bring in a point guard is what I'm saying. I would be comfortable if they just um ran with this lineup and um, you had that three guard backcourt of Horn Taylor and Morsell. And it's not like you don't have point guards on the roster either, right? You do have Leon Bass and LJ Thomas, and you sign Trey Parker, um, all three of whom were kind of point guard recruits. Yeah, so maybe one of them, maybe Trey Parker comes in and he's the guy that can be in the nine-man rotation right away, or maybe one of those, Thomas or Pass, takes a step forward and is um, you know the sixth, seventh man, and when things get a little hectic, when you need that stabilizing presence, maybe they can come in and you know, replace a Taylor or a Horn for a 10 minute stretch and like calm the game down. But, um, you know, like Keats' teams like to play at that, you know, lo- getting lots of shots up on high pace offense and, um, having two combo guards, I think could actually just be a perfect fit. So, no, I'm not that worried about it. I'm probably in between where most fans are and most observers are and where you are. Uh, okay. I do think there's a concern. I only in the sense of I think there are a lot of pieces there to be a top twenty-five team. I'm going to apologize in advance, but I see my dog at the window, and she might go barking at any second. So, if listeners hear bark, I apologize. But back to my point, I think a lot of the moves NC State have made that if they are healthy, with the depth and the versatility and the options and the experience easily could be a top 25 team if it could find quality point guard play. Um, And I think that, um, I think that's the, that's the issue. If you get a quality point guard, um, I think that's the issue facing NC State. I get a, Phone call coming in. Um, the question is, do you feel like you can get that on the roster? In my opinion, on paper, that's very questionable. Versus, but I also look at it this way. Jaden Bradley was a five-star, but it didn't look, he, didn't, he still had his struggles at Alabama last year. There was no guarantee he was going to be a quality point guard. So, it just doesn't look like there are a lot of quality point guards in the transfer portal, and some of those that were quality point guards seem to be locked in. I know that young man who from Akron that was like the MAC Player of the Year sounds like he's locked in for Illinois, from all accounts. So, you know, it's also what's out there, right? And that's the other question. So. I would prefer they have another point guard. Of course, that would create a bait. They need to find a scholarship to do that. You know, people have been asking me about it on the chat, and I've given my opinion of where I think that scholarship might come from. Um, but I, I understand the need for a point guard because just because it can make a um, a great point guard. We lost Ethan there for seconds. So I'm going to ramble while Ethan tries to get his connection reset. Um, there he is. All right. Sorry, that's rambling there. Um, so, I'm in between. I think they can still be a good team with this roster as it is. I think there's a top 25 potential if you mm-hmm. can find a quality point guard. Uh, and right now, that might be separating top 25 versus being a good team that's probably underappreciated nationally. So, long rambling answer there, but that's my take. Um, Ethan, let's talk really quickly about women's basketball. I know we got a lot of supporters of women's basketball. You've been working the phones. Uh, may or may not be an official visitor this weekend. We know there were some reports that there were going to be two official visitors. We can confirm one is not happening and one is iffy. They have picked up a girl from Sacramento State. I'm going to let Ethan pronounce her name and because he talks better than I do. And then also, they've lost a few. 
Uh, everybody expected the three seniors to move on. Camille Harvey transferring to Illinois. Dakia Brown Turner transferred to Maryland. Um, looks like Jada Boyd is just moving on from basketball. Uh, the big surprise, kind of a surprise, but we were hinting at it. Diamond Johnson has also entered the transfer portal. So, Ethan, your take on the women's basketball situation right now? To be honest, I'm a little surprised they haven't been a little more active in the portal, just in terms of um, they have a lot of scholarship spaces right now, and um, they've only filled one spot as of now. Um, I know it's not like they're not working to. They're, um, they were going to bring in a couple official visitors this weekend. Um, then I heard that one of those visits was up in the air. Um, there is growing optimism around that visit that it could happen but um it's not confirmed and i'm not going to share the name until it is confirmed but um when i do it will be on the wolfpacker.com um and then earlier um kiana hamilton fisher from long beach state a double digit score out west um was going to make an official visit out to raleigh it's not happening anymore i heard from a source this morning it's not happening um, so that leaves the only set in stone transfer commit right now is, um, and I, I apologize, Katie, if I'm mispronouncing your last name, but Katie um, Kenewetta, who um, was awesome at Sacramento State last year. Um, I believe the numbers might not be perfect here, but I believe she shot 170 field goals and 156 of them were threes. Yeah. And um, she was top 10 in the country in three point percentage. Um, just an absolute knockdown shooter and um, will be the perfect player to have next to an Isaiah James or Sanaya Rivers who, um, you know, work best when they're getting to the rim. And um, I'll also add in Zoe Brooks, who I'm also the five-star freshman. She also thrived getting to the bucket. So um, she's a perfect addition. I am thrilled that um, Katie is joining the team. She's got um, some height to her too, right? Like she's six one or six two or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I know she's over six feet. Um, she rebounds well too. So also knock down free throw shooter. She doesn't shoot many of them because she really <laughs> only takes threes. Yeah. But um, when she gets to the line, I believe she was over eighty yeah. percent. So does a lot of things really well, and um, should should fill a shooting void that at times was really present on last year's team. So now like. It comes down to who's replacing Diamond Johnson. Is it going to be one of the uh, uh, junior guards? Is it going to be a Zaya Sanaya? We'll see. Um, is it going to be a transfer? It looks like they are targeting a guard. So um, we'll see if they bring in a guard that can kind of um, replace what is all, an all-ACC caliber player in Diamond. That, that's a huge loss for the team. And then uh, at, at the post position, um, there's a lot of mystery there. Uh, I'm not really sure um, what's going to be happening. Um I will share that um, the potential visitor for this weekend would be a post player. Um, And it does sound like they do want to bring a post player in during this portal cycle, Um, which would be needed, I would say, um, because right now you're running with um, River Baldwin and then um, freshman. So, um, and River, she was hurt for most of the year, um, even when, she was playing. I mean, everyone saw it. She had a huge knee brace on yeah. that um, definitely limited um, movement a little bit. But bringing in someone that can compete for a starting job with River would be great. And um, I don't think we're near done with um, seeing some portal additions. Yeah. But um, as you've hinted at before, um, I don't think it's a guarantee or even maybe likely that Westmore will use like five transfer yeah. portal scholarships this year. We've talked about it on the board. I mentioned in the chat, my understanding, too, was kind of the target number of uh, adding a guard and a post to go with Katie Pinoretta, um, who is a tremendous shooter, as you noted. Um, remember that, that I think they feel very comfortable with their recruiting class. That Joey Brooks is maybe the most highly touted women's basketball recruit ever at a high school now. Shania Rivers and Diamond Johnson were in that territory when they came out of high school, but they went to other other schools first. Um, you know, Lacey Steele, very accomplished high school girl who had a nice offer list. Um, 
she's another guard that's coming in next year. They do have two forward post players, Mallory uh, Collier from Tennessee, and I'm blanking on the other girl who's from uh, uh, the Texas area, whose sister with the WNBA high draft pick. Maddie Cox. Thank you, Maddie Cox. Uh, with the, it also coming in, so they do have that as well. Um, and Jim mentioned they have hosted one official visitor who had not made a decision yet. I don't know if it's too official. I should say, I clarify that. But one visitor who is a post player from a Big Ten school uh, who we talked about on the, on the website, she did visit, I want to say, was it this past weekend or maybe the weekend before that or somewhere in that vicinity? The weekend uh, before. Weekend before. She had not made a decision yet. So, um don't know if that's good or bad if you're if you're NC State, but so they clearly are checking some options. I've long believed in West I trust. Um, a track record speaks for itself. It is a strong track record. You know, last year was interesting because if you look at some of the teams they beat, including a team that was playing in one of the most decorated national title games in women's basketball history. And she State beat that team on the road by double digits, if I recall, despite the fact um, that, and I can't believe I'm blanking on her name too, but th- that she went off. Caitlin uh, Clark? Yes, thank you. Uh, um, she, she, she went off against NC State. She had a couple of logo shots on NC State. Um, but NC State still won that game by double digits, I believe. Um, they beat some quality teams last year. Louisville beat them on the road. Um, beat a fully healthy Notre Dame team at home. Those teams had very nice NCAA tournament runs. Beat North Carolina at home. It was just those weird losses last year. Those mm-hmm. kind of head scratching losses. The Boston College lost at home and Georgia Tech on the road. You just had a few too many of the, a couple of those, and then to give it up there at the end to to Princeton in the first round in a game that you really controlled for about 35 minutes. Yeah, yeah kind of emblematic of how the season went, I felt. But um, I don't think it's like a massive rebuilding job or anything like that. I, I don't think there is a need for that thought. Um, so I'm curious to see how it ends up. And this may be a situation where maybe this was more comfortable for West this coming year a little bit more defined roles because you're trying to fit everybody in. They also had a lot of injuries as well. So mm-hmm. we'll see how that plays out. One last subject because I know Ethan's got a busy day. Your thoughts on the transfers for the spring and football. And she State Law 5, Ben Finley's headed to Cal. Thornton Gentry's headed to Appalachian State offensive lineman. We don't know yet where Chase Hatley, linebacker, maybe safety, and Jayan Reeves, defensive lineman, are going. And, of course, the big name is running back Jimmy Sumo Conbe hitting the portal. To me, of the five, that's the one that stings a little bit because I felt like with Michael Allen and Jordan Houston and Delbert Mims and DeMarcus Jones, you have depth. But all those guys are kind of running backs that I would say they get you what's there. You give them a lane for four yards, they're probably going to get your four yards. I thought Demi Sumo Kambe was a playmaker. He could get stuff on his own. And that, the numbers from Pro Football Focus, as I put up on an analysis piece, kind of bears that out. Um, and I think they might miss that, his ability to – he can break tackle, get yards after contact, he can break away. How big a loss is that for NC State? I mean – they missed it last year when he was hurt. It, it, it was a clear difference on offense with him on the field versus off the field. Um, I'm a huge Demi Sumo fan. Um, and I mean, shoot, like the coaching staff it is too. Uh, we heard about it all off season last year, and then he immediately showed it on the field. Um, when he was healthy, he was great. And if if he was going to be healthy this all this whole upcoming season, I think he has all ACC potential as a running back. Um, so. It's a massive loss. I think it really hurts. And now you're in a position where um, I'd give Michael Allen a little more credit. I do think he showed some flashes to um, make a little bit of something out of nothing um, down the stretch last season, um, especially in the passing game, which um, obviously will be a big role under 
Robert and I's offense. But um, now you're looking at a situation where I think the running back room is probably going to be about the same caliber as last year. I think um, Michael Allen, I'm pretty optimistic about him, and I think he could replace most of, if not all, of the uh, – um, production Demi Sumo produced, and if healthy, could of course exceed that. And then um, I think Jordan Houston is, you know, he's a starting caliber ACC running back, and at this point, he probably is about what he is as a player. Um, I am really excited to see him get in space more because I thought he was at his best when he was catching screen um, screen passes where he was, you know, you just have to make a DB or a linebacker miss, and then he could take off for 12 yards, but. I was a little bit of a tangent, but that that's definitely the biggest loss. I remain a little bit optimistic about NC State's running back situation, but uh, I was really high on that group with Demi Sumo. So I think he's going to probably end, at a, end up at a Power 5 school and have a very successful career. And you could tell, I think, Robert and I was high on it too because one of the sneaky things in the spring game, there was a lot of two running back formations. Yeah. We saw some of that with Tim Beck, but not a ton of it. There was a lot of it in the spring game, which led me to believe that Robert and I had kind of identified those running backs as a potential strength. And so he was finding ways to get multiple running backs on the field at the same time. Um, you know, we'll see what this does to that. They, are, they do have Kendrick Raphael also who enrolled mm-hmm. early. He flashed, you know, a little bit of issues with ball security in the spring game, but did show some of the natural vision that you like to see. And when impressed me, I don't think he had got hit for a loss while running behind the reserve offensive lineman in that spring game against the first string defense, if I recall correctly. And that's a very good, good sign. He, he wasn't going to pile up numbers because of that situation. Um, but to not get hit for a loss is pretty impressive. Um, obviously, though, he did have a fumble. He also dropped a pass. It would have probably been a big game. You know, Ben Finley leaving hurts for depth. I don't think he was going to factor into the starting role, but we saw this past year that, you know, <laughs> catastrophe can yeah. happen every now and then. And NC State was just uniquely qualified to be able to handle that cat- the catastrophe that c- came upon the la- quarterback position last year. It may not be this year. This year they may need to have normal luck when it comes to quarterback health. Uh, so that's just something to follow. So, all right, that should do it for this edition of the War Packers Show. Um, a few reminders, please rate and review this podcast wherever you may listen to your podcast. Also, to subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel and our Twitter ch- channel. Our handle is very simple. It's the War Packer everywhere. So it's the easiest handle to remember. Follow Ethan on Twitter, Ethan M. McDowell. Ethan M. McDowell. Uh, and he dropped. And you can if, if you can't remember that, follow the Wolfpack on Twitter. It retweets Ethan a lot, and then you can follow Ethan from there. Um, also, um, please sign up for the website. Got a lot coming over the next few weeks. As NC State's roster just about filled out in basketball, and recruiting is going to go crazy. And then we're going to get the best football team coverage anywhere on the internet after that. And last but not least, please support our sponsors, rogueshop.com. That's rogueshop.com, R-O-G as in girl, U-E-S-H-O-P.com. Get all your natural cannabis needs, whether you have uh, sleep deprivation, you suffer from anxiety or chronic pain. These are natural, legal, safe ways to help deal with them. Maybe if you hadn't had a lot of luck with other uh, remedies, this might be the one for you. Yeah. Give them a try. Go to their website. They have a live chat feature which will answer all your questions for you with the actual human being. They can point you to the products you might want to try for whatever your need may be. It's a small company, husband and wife outfit. Um, Husband is a disabled veteran who uses these products himself to deal with some of the issues he faces and certainly is a big believer in it. So give them a a look, rogueshop.com. So for Ethan, I'm Matt. This has been the Wolfpacker Show.